currently in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on our first ever transatlantic cruise, and we want to tell you about the good, bad, and ugly. What's up? My name is Jordan. And I'm Jared. And we are JJ, JJ Cruise. Cruise. This is obviously a place where we talk about cruising. We are a cruise YouTube channel. And if you love cruising as much as we do, we invite you to hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the channel. Yes, and hit that thumbs up button to let us know that you really enjoy these videos and want more of them. We're trying to hit 30,000 subscribers, so be a part of the first 30K. Be a part of the first 30K JJ Crew. <laughs> Shout out to all the JJ Crew that are watching. Jared and I love you. We see you. Well, first off, I think we need to just answer the question, what is a transatlantic cruise? A transatlantic cruise is different than most cruises and the fact that you are starting on one side of the Atlantic and crossing the Atlantic Ocean to go to another port on the other side. For us and our example, we started at Port Everglades and Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We are in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on a 14-day journey to Rome, Italy. We are so excited to be going there and we are actually past our seventh day so we have a really good understanding we've been through a lot already and we really understand where this is so this is our first impressions after the first seven days of our transatlantic cruise and just to be clear the first seven days were all sea days so yes. we've been seeing nothing but ocean we've gotten a really good feel of how these transatlantics I think work um, and then tomorrow we will actually arrive at our first port of call in Portugal so let's talk about the good bad and ugly starting here with the good and actually, this first great thing about a transatlantic cruise was shocking to us. Yeah, there's a lot of questions that are in our minds before we even got on this cruise. And the first one was, is this just going to be a lot of older people? And obviously, we've been on many cruises, and that's not a problem for us. But we do like a diversity in age. Surprisingly for us, there is a lot of different ages on board with some limitations here. There are a lot of different ages of a Adults. There are very few kids on board, I think three for the entire sailing, and there's about 1,200 guests on board. And so with that in mind, if you're looking at a transatlantic and you have a family with a lot of kids, eh, they might not hook up with a lot of other kids and have fun because it's a limited amount of kids. But if you're a family with adult children, this might be a great cruise for you. And that's what we've noticed is there's a lot of families on board but the kids are all grown up um, and maybe the grandkids have been left behind or left at home because of course this is still school season so kids are still in school but that has been something that's been kind of nice because it has kind of felt like this adults only vibe or party on board and we again did not expect that jared and i have taken longer sailings there's been often times that we have been the youngest people on board especially 12, 13, 14 night cruises, um, that is not the case for this particular sailing. It could, of course, also be the fact that we're on Celebrity Edge, we're on a newer ship, a little bit more of an innovative ship. I think that this ship attracts a younger crowd. Um, but regardless, it has to go on our good list because it made us pretty happy. Another point that Jordan brought up here is that we're on board Celebrity Edge. We're not going to review the actual ship herself. We've already done that, so you can click up ahead. We'll put a little banner there so you can get a full review or a ship tour of Celebrity Edge. Going along with what Jordan was talking about regarding the vibe on board, uh, it is a very lively vibe. We have the question, is this just going to be a lot of days at sea where you're reading a book and that is it? Not necessarily the case for our sailing. We have a lot of different dancing, a lot of different activities on board, a lot of new activities too. There's a guest choir you can be a part of. <laughs> I definitely partook in that for a, a rehearsal or two. And it is just a unique experience in the fact that it is not just a bunch of days at sea without anything to do. And then of course you have things like Deal or No Deal, which celebrity is known to do happening quite frequently. Um, so those favorite activities that you love and cherish about your traditional cruise experience are here, but there's a way more of them, which also is a lot of fun. Oh, completely. A ton of fun. The next thing on the good list here is definitely the people that we have met on board. Now, we've talked about the range of age and the different activities. However, what we've loved about everyone that we've met on this sailing is that there is a shared interest for travel and cruising and a little bit more of adventurous cruising. Obviously, we're crossing the Atlantic by ship. And a good point of this is actually how it relates 
to an inaugural or maiden voyage sailing. Usually the maiden voyage or the inaugural sailors are those cruisers who love cruising so much that even if something goes wrong, they don't complain about it. They know that that's part of cruising and they love it. That is the same kind of people that we have on board Celebrity Edge for this transatlantic and we love that. We love that everyone's go happy. They're not complaining about anything at all. They're really just here to have a great cruise. Obviously Jared and I love cruising and we love connecting with other people on this form of travel. So for us it's been a big plus to be on board with all of these other cruise addicts. <laughs> Our next part of the good of this transatlantic crossing for us is the entertainment. There's a lot of varied entertainment in the theater that aren't just those of the production shows. You know, you don't just have the production shows happening three times in the cruise. You actually have a lot of headlining acts or specially guest acts that are fantastic and different from each other. You have everything from Broadway performers to cabarets to Oh my gosh, aerial dancers. It's been so much fun watching all of these different guest performers and the performances on the ship. And yeah, they've been different every single night. Guitarist, opera, I mean, you name it, it's on board this transatlantic crossing and we're here for it. Last but not least on the good list, we have to mention the food. The food has been shockingly great. Night after night, every single dinner that we have has been absolutely delicious. And something that I think is a misconception that I definitely thought when I got on board was that, oh, maybe like during nights five, six, or seven, before we have a stop and get more food on board, the vegetables will start to go stale and things will kind of start to taste off. We have yet to have a bad meal here on the Celebrity Edge. And of course, like we've said in our past reviews, we love the food on the ship, but the food the whole time so far has been great. That is the majority of the good. Of course, there's so much good happening on board. You know, we're just Scott, we're just making sure that you have a piece of the information here, what we think are the highlights. Now we're gonna get into the low lights, <laughs> which is the bad of a transatlantic crossing. And the first thing is the pool. The pool time that you get on board a transatlantic crossing is deceiving. A lot of times you're thinking, oh, I'm going to the Mediterranean. It's got to be super warm there. It's got to be the best pool season. Well, it's middle of April, a little bit later in April, <laughs> and the weather gets quite chilly quickly. We have had multiple days where the pool deck is either not open because of the ocean and just the rockiness or because it's just not cold. It's not warm enough. You know, it's a little cold and chilly and no one really wants to dive into that pool. Along with that, outdoor activities are also a bit limited. Um, they've moved a lot of things indoors. One of the restaurants, Normandy, actually has become a common place for things like physical activities, water aerobics, which <laughs> happen out of the water um, on many days. Uh, so if you are someone that absolutely loves to be outside and loves outdoor activities, on a transatlantic crossing that might be way less than, let's say, a seven night cruise in the Caribbean. Of course, you can still go outside. It's just that the activities that you love and are usually outdoors aren't in outdoors or inside now. So you can still enjoy the ocean breeze and relax on a lounger. It's just not as active outdoors. The next topic is something we actually really discuss and not sure if it really is that bad because it's surprisingly good for us from what we expected. We assumed the Wi-Fi would be something that kind of goes out almost immediately. Uh, we've had some good Wi-Fi days and we've had some not so good Wi-Fi <laughs> days, but to be honest with you, we were surprised that we even had some good days. We're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and whenever we do have Wi-Fi, it is not bad. And we really thought that it was going to be very hard to do anything for a majority of the days. We've been able to do some stuff, but overall we would say it is not what you get typically on a cruise and you need to know it. And that is why we put it in the bad category. Lastly for the bad, before we get into the ugly, which is coming up here, is closing times. This was a big surprise for us actually because we thought, like a lot of people, Everything's going to be open all the time. We're at sea. You don't have to worry about going to a port the next day and having to cut off by going into their waters of that home country. The casino closes early. The club closes early. The buffet or the late night snacks are closed everything before midnight on this ship. And what we had heard is that is a little bit more normal for transatlantic crossings. That's part of the reason why we're including it here is that 
all of those staff, all the crew really need to get their rest because they do have such a long day every sea day. And so we completely understand it, but it's something that was uh, unexpected and it's really hard when you're someone that goes out, dances all night, and then you have nowhere to go following, whether it's the club, casino, or just to get a bite to eat. And this is a bit, of course, subjective. There's people that are early morning risers that, you know, like to get ahead of their day and are in bed by 9, 10 o'clock. Neither of us are that way. We definitely are late night people. We enjoy the nightlife on a cruise ship. Um, so it's forced us to be a little bit more responsible, I guess, <laughs> in uh, the times that we keep. But, yeah, we would love to see things stay open, just maybe a pinch later um, while we're doing this crossing. We almost forgot there was one other really bad thing, and we have to throw it in here. And we are obviously crossing from Florida to Europe. When you do this type of crossing, your days are shorter. Um, you actually have 23-hour days for most days instead of 24-hour days as you're crossing and changing times. This has been the most difficult part of the sailing. It's actually really hard on your body, I think, to go um, from having 24-hour days to 23-hour days. And we're really looking forward to doing the opposite next fall when we're going to be coming from the UK to the States where we're going to have 25 hour days to see what that is. On um, the 23 hour days, we don't like it. No, <laughs> it is definitely hard to get used to. We are at the climax and that is the ugly of transatlantic cruising. And most of you probably are already thinking about this and where is this at? Well, it is in the ugly and that is the weather. You have no idea what kind of weather you're going to get, but the chance of there being a giant storm like what we had to deal with here on our transatlantic crossing is a little higher than when you're just going to the Caribbean or along the California coast. The weather on board this crossing has been... It's been rough. Rough. <laughs> to say the least and it really makes things difficult that's part of the reason why the pool has not been as active as well is because even when it's nice enough out if it's too rocky it is unsafe to go in the pool sometimes even in the gym to go on your favorite bike or whatever it may be to work out it's just harder to stabilize and that causes a lot of things to shut down the ship has particularly been um, rocking a lot all week from side to side. So, you know, you've got things from people not being able to really walk straight in the hallways to people falling out of their beds. Um, <laughs> it's been quite dramatic, and I think we've both seen some of the biggest waves that we've ever seen in our, in our entire lives. Uh, now, we've heard from other passengers it's not always like this. You know, of course, again, this is going to depend on what time of year you're going and what the weather system that's going around the Atlantic is like. You could, you know, possibly have the most perfect crossing where it's 80 degrees every single day and there's no problems, or it could be storming the entire time. So it's just something to know and think about. That's why I think transatlantics are for cruise people. Yes, yes, completely agree. And if you're not a cruiser, if this is your first ever cruise, don't do it. No. Please don't do a transatlantic as your first cruise. Do some three or four nights to get started, especially if you're someone who's prone to get seasick. This is one of those cruises that you can take and you can try to be properly prepared with whether it's those C bands, whether it's any of the medication you might take for it or those patches behind the ears. But at, at the end of the day, it's going to be rocky. And if you get seasick a lot, you might be not happy with the cruise. So, I just want to put this question out there. Yes. Do we like a transatlantic and would we do it again? That's a good question. The answer is, of course, yes. yes. We have actually <laughs> loved this sailing overall. Um, I think I speak for both of us when I say it's been one of our favorite cruises ever. We have met some of the most incredible people on this sailing and we wouldn't have been able to do that without being on this transatlantic cruise. With that in mind, though, we want to hear from you. Have you been on a transatlantic cruise before? If you have, let us know your thoughts. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Are you going on more in the future? Or if you haven't been on a transatlantic cruise, what about it really entices you to be on a transatlantic cruise? We want to hear from you in the comments below. Yes, we do. And I'm thinking next, maybe we should do a Trans-Pacific. Oh, maybe huh. we should. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Of course, like always, we invite you to subscribe and be a part of our online cruise community. Join the JG crew. Be a part of the first 30,000 by hitting that subscribe button below. Okay, that is it for now. Until next time, see ya. See ya.